morning, everybody. Um, I'm Marco Settina, research scientist at the conference, the organizers for inviting me uh, to present on uh, building a system. So building a large scale quantum computer in an academic environment. Um, we are funded by IARPA under the Logic U program with the goal of realizing quantum error correction at the level of a logical quantum bit. That is to say, realizing an error corrected qubit. And we have built a system to implement all the necessary functionality and capability in order to realize this. Um, I'm showing an actual picture of the ion trap here that we're using together with a chain of 20 odd ions trapped in this trap. Um, although our stated goal is error correction, I want to point out that the qubit that we're using is already very, very good. Um, we use the uh, two hyperfine states in Ethereum 171 plus ions, uh, which uh, one could manipulate as simply as using microwaves, um, as shown here. And uh, by using this technique, using a multiple pulse echo, uh, we measure in uh, Actually, our system, we measure T2 times in excess of two seconds and with probably limited by our microwave oscillator. So um, T2 times with multiple echoes in excess of 10 minutes have been demonstrated in uh, Kihuan Kim's group at Jinghua. So I might tentatively rephrase a bit the, the goal and the challenge of error correction in the context at least of trapped ions and hyperfine qubits, it's not error correcting the errors of qubits that one leaves alone, but error correcting any errors that may arise during operation, especially in two qubit gates. Um, and this is something that in particular our system and the codes we're using, as I will describe later, are well suited to. Um, in order to perform detection of the state of our qubits, as you probably well know, uh, we use resonance fluorescence. Uh, where the 171 ethereum plus ions are excited with resonant 369 light on the D1 line. Um, and if the qubit is in one of the two hyperfine states, it will scatter photons. Here's a histogram of uh, photons that are collected in our experiment with about NA.6 numerical aperture lens. Um, and if the qubit is in the other state, uh, the, it remains dark with the exception of a little bit of dark counts that we, if we set our threshold above the dark counts, we obtain in the system that I will be presenting 99.3% qubit detection fidelity and higher than 99.8 or 9 have been achieved in the group of Jiangsan Kim at Duke uh, in our collaboration. Um, in order to manipulate our qubits, we employ a, a Raman process which couples the two um, hyperfine states uh, by exciting the electron uh, from the S orbital into the excited state P orbital, where the spin orbit coupling will couple the angular momentum of the electron to the angular momentum of the electronic spin. After we de-excite the electron back into the ground state, we may end up with the electron spin flip, which has the effect of manipulating the hyperfine state and hence our qubit. Um, the remarkable thing is, although we use the laser to perform our qubit manipulations, um, this laser does not need to be particularly stabilized. Um, it's commercial laser uh, that runs almost as fine as we want out of the box as soon as you buy it. Um, we have taken the liberty of, uh, in collaboration with the laser manufacturer, and this was work led by Kai Hudek here in the audience, to modify this laser to control its repetition rate. So it's a pulsed laser, which allows us to bridge the hyperfine transition with a single laser without using modulators. But that does have the drawback of causing AC Stark shifts due to the presence of all the off-resonant comb teeth that drive our transition. And by varying the repetition rate of this laser, by tuning the length of its oscillator cavity, we have demonstrated that we can successfully null these Stark shifts. So I would argue that the use of pulsed lasers in this context to manipulate qubits does not have any deleterious effects, provided one can control, compared to CW lasers, provided one can control the repetition rate as shown here. Um, in order to entangle our trapped ions, um, we focus individual laser beams of the 355 uh, Raman light onto individual qubits. 
And as you, pro as you know from a long history of the work in trapped ions, we use the Raman process to entangle the internal hyperfine state of the ions with the radial modes of motion of the ion chain. Because the whole ion chain shares the radial modes, um, if we drive individual modes in such a way that at the, from the beginning to the end of our laser pulse, we excite and then de-excite the radial mode of motion, we can disentangle the, internal, the spin that we coupled to motion at the end of our gate, and we're left with a, with a gate phase that depends on the total area in phase space that is enclosed. Um, our gates operate, this leads to a uh, adjustable phase XX gate in the X basis of the qubit. Um, and with typical gate times of 10 to 100 microseconds. Um, I point out that this is an example of a molmer sorensen gate, which is um, first order insensitive to the thermal motion of the ion, so does not require ground state cooling of these modes. The, Second thing I would point out is that by using radial modes, we also suppress the effects of heating of, uh, of chains. We suppress the effects of heating due to electric field noise on the trap, and uh, uh, which would lead to errors uh, due to change in motion during the gate. Um, as a challenge for error correction, our goal is to implement the uh, complicated circuit, basically. Uh, which is a bacon shore 913 code. Although this is the particular error correction code which implements one logical qubit with uh, nine physical qubits and a distance three code, um, I point out that the system that we have built is general and it can implement a wide variety of codes including surface codes such as surface 17. Um, another part of error correction is to, uh, after you have encoded your uh, logical qubit into the physical qubits, you need to check for the presence of a bit flip and then act accordingly. Uh, performing this check in Ethereum uh, involves shining 369 resonant light to read out the state of the ions, uh, which, has, which would have normally the drawback of decohering the ions that are not directly addressed due to photon scattering. In order to get around this problem, uh, in the future we're planning to, uh, to execute a more complex algorithm that involves splitting the chain of ions so that the ions uh, that are being detected are split away by about a millimeter from the ions that store the physical information. And then at the end of the day, remerge all the ions into a single chain using another species of ions for sympathetic cooling. Um, so I've said, I've presented the challenge of a complex circuit of error correction, of working with multiple species of ions. Um, how do you build all of this? Well, as usual, you start with an empty lab. Uh, this is a picture from December 2016 in PSC. And over, uh, over a period of years, you build it up um, into a single system, um, into a black box. And uh, now we don't want to keep the black box secret, um, but before opening the box, let me point out that there's no way that this could come together in just a few years without a lot of help from the external collaborators of this project. Sandia National Laboratories, who supplied the ion trap. AOSense, uh, who built an integrated rack-based laser system. Called Quanta, who are working on miniaturizing the packaging of ion traps. Harris, who delivered the optical system that is used to individually address um, and manipulate individual qubits using a 32-channel acoustic modulator and coherent with whom we have a partnership that uh, provided the know-how to modify the repetition rate of their commercial laser and of course our funders who footed the bill for this whole enterprise. Um, as I said, I don't want to keep the box closed. If you open the box up, it looks like most any other atomic physics experiment, uh, just a little bit smaller, uh, where the main advantage is that the Iron the ion trap, the ion trapping chamber is tightly mechanically and optically coupled to the 32 channel acoustic optic modulator which addresses the individual ions in the, in the system. And this tight coupling of the optics to the chamber provides for mechanical and optical path stability and hence decreasing noise of our, of our laser beams that hit the qubits. 
Um, in order to trap our qubits, we use um, an HOA, that stands for high optical access, trap supplied by Sandia National Lab. Um, and we can trap uh, 20 to 30 ions and achieve about 30 minute lifetimes of these ion chains in operating conditions of our gates. Um, and we, as I said, we manipulate our ions by these individually focused laser beams that in this picture come from the bottom. There's 32 of them, each of one in addressing one individual ion. And the second half of the Raman process is provided by, an, by a beam that globally illuminates the whole ion chain that comes from the left here. And that this is a zoom in picture of the trap. It's hanging upside down to avoid dust. Um, an advantage of a microfabricated surface trap is that one has really precise control over long chains of ions. And we make great use already of this control by loading our ions one ion at a time. So every ion that I will, on which I will be showing data later is loaded through a little load hole about a millimeter away from the computation zone and then shuttled a full millimeter through a junction of this trap uh, in order to build up a chain. So it takes about a few minutes to build up a chain of about 20 ions. And here's a picture taken with the camera through a high NA lens of such a chain being built up. Um, now, the other advantage of this controlling chains is that we can focus the light that comes from our individual ions um, using a high NA optics into an array of 32 multi-mode fibers. Uh, by using multi-mode fibers, we do not suffer from detection. If it, we do not suffer from fiber coupling efficiency and don't have a stringent uh, mode quality requirements, a single mode coupling, allowing us with a fairly straightforward setup to uh, detect in a very discriminating way the state of each of the ions in the chain. So here is an example. We apply an electric field to sweep three ions past three detectors um, and detect the readout on each of the three detectors. Uh, by doing this, we measure that we have about 1% crosstalk in photons between the neighboring fibers, corresponding after thresholding to half a percent detection error. Um, and ne next nearest neighbor crosstalk, 2.2% error. Uh, this could be further improved by um, eliminating some residual astigmatism in the uh, imaging setup. Um, as I said before, we would like to use the system to implement an error correction code. Um, and the target system that we're looking at is a chain of 15 ions, uh, nine of which are physical qubits, four of which are the ancilla onto which the, um, the state, the error checking state is mapped uh, before being read out. And two ions essentially serve as end capping electrodes preserving near equispacing of the middle ions and allowing their accurate addressability with our um, equally spaced laser beams. Uh, um, using the, we have used the system to perform single qubit gates and by using compound SK1 pulses that are first order insensitive to crosstalk and to intensity noise, um, we, obtain, we obtain fidelities uh, in excess of 99.8%. So uh, 0.2 uh, percent error, uh, not including the error of state preparation and measurement. Uh, we have uh, performed these measurements, especially led by Mike Goldman here in the audience, um, using, uh, using randomized benchmarking. Um, we have We have also performed it using randomized benchmarking, obtaining fidelities in excess of 99.9%. Whoops. Oh. <laughs> um, of course, in order to perform uh, two qubit gates in the system, we need to manipulate the motion of our ions. Um, and we can probe the quality of our motional addressing by probing the sidebands of motion, uh, both red and blue sidebands. Um, here I'm showing the radial sideband spectrum of the chain of 15 ions. You can see only 13 modes because the first and the last uh, are actually doublets which don't resolve pairs of modes. Um, you can show, we show very high suppression of the red sidebands indicating that we cool all of our sidebands to less than 0.05 quanta 
uh, with the exception of the center of mass modes or near center of mass, which are subject to heating by the correlated electric field produced by the trap. So as I pointed out before, by using these high order modes to perform gates, we can skirt the issues caused by the heating of the trap. Uh, of course, we have characterized the heating and we measure using the mode at 45 degrees that we typically use about 166 quanta, three megahertz quanta per second heating rates, which are close to expected for these traps. Um, we, can address, as a, uh, we can address the particular modes by uh, tuning our laser detunings of the Raman process uh, to a specific value. And as an example, here is a manipulation of motion using the blue sideband spectroscopy on one of these modes. Um, we ob obtain very good stability of these modes over a period of days, and we, have very, uh, we, ha and we can match it very well to a voltage model of the trap. Uh, now, of course, in order to perform two qubit gates on this system, we apply shaped pulses to the ions. Um, so far, we have used amplitude modulated pulses, which ensure that all the modes, uh, the phase space trajectories of all the modes, close at the end of the pulse. Um, a remarkable, uh, you I might imagine that as the number of ions grows and the number of modes of the ion chain grows, the complexity of putting the motion of all the ions back where it was at the end of the gate would grow and become unmanageable for a large number of ions. Uh, remarkably, from theoretical work in the group and, uh, and some of the practice experiments, we know that actually this complexity is quite manageable and scales only polynomially with number of ions up to sizes of about 20 and 250 ions that one can envision these systems having in the foreseeable future. So we actually do not expect that the proliferation of modes and the attendant classical control will be a significant limiting factor in these systems. Um, so using a very simple shaped pulse tuned uh, between neighboring modes like this, uh, we have performed sample gate between ion 6 and ion 10 here in this chain. And uh, we have uh, characterized the fidelity of this gate by performing repeated gates and after a variable number of gates, um, scanning the phase of a subsequent pi over two pulse, uh, so looking at parity oscillation um, of the parity of these two ions. And by comparing the contrast of the, uh, by using the information about the contrast of the parity fringe together with the population in the zero, zero, and one, one states, um, without applying the pi over two pulse, we can extract the fidelity or the loss of fidelity per gate in the system. Um, um, obtaining by a linear fit to the infidelity lines, um, a, a fidelities of about 97% uh, per gate. Um, just focusing at one gate and uh, looking, at, uh, looking more closely at the um, spam correction, we can extract fidelities of 98.5%. Um, so using this capability, we have performed the first steps towards realizing the Baker Shore 913 code, um, where we selected a subcircuit uh, which performs a parity check, uh, that is to say XXX, X, Six, nine, X, 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 parity check on six of our nine physical qubits. Um, and we implement this by a series of XX gates between each of these qubits and one specific ancilla. So to, perf to measure the parity, X, 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 parity of this plaquette in the Bay Control 913 code, uh, we perform six subsequent XX gates between these qubits and one of the remaining ions which serves as, an, as our ancilla. And we do this in our full 15 qubit system. Um, and here, we vary the initial state. Um, to characterize this, we vary the initial state of our six qubits um, in the x basis, uh, here encoded as a binary number from zero to seven. Um, and we look at the parity shown in black uh, detected by our uh, readout of the ancilla. And we can perform this for a full set of uh, 64 uh, states of the six um, 
x x go ahead. a very good question. Um, each two qubit gate takes about 200 microseconds. Um, so the total runtime with six of these is a bit over a millisecond. Um, we do not have significant problems at a millisecond. Uh, however, the full circuit uh, for the decoder, which would include 24 XX gates, uh, would take a number of milliseconds. And over that time scale, we do anticipate that some of the effects of heating of the ion chain start to matter, um, in particular the axial heating, um, not radial. Um, and we expect that to be mitigated by the sympathetic cooling ions that are needed in any case for the split and merge operations. Um, the detection process itself would take about, also about 100 microseconds, so relatively short. The uh, split and merge uh, would probably take about millisecond to maybe not, could be made as fast as a millisecond. Um, without pushing, it could be a few milliseconds. Um, and the main heating that arises from that would be axial again. Uh, the radial heating. Uh, and other groups have demonstrated splits and merge, merges can be done with very low radio heating. Provided you have a sympathetic coolant, which we, exactly. Exactly. Um, the parity error of a readout of 18% at present is consistent with our current two qubit gate fidelity of 97%. Um, and uh, if you want more details about our error budget, I have some extra slides. Um, seeing that I'm out of time, I would like to thank everybody for their attention and thank, the, um, thank both the current, labeled in blue, and past members of the Eureka team, as well as the whole Monroe group um, that helped in many ways with this work. Thank you.